stop social distancing. I believe you don't really need that mask. You have a viewer who has been very, very eager to hear from Mr. Ojuko. <laughs> so I can remove the mask? Indeed you can, sir. All right, thank you. It, it, just just yes, remove yeah. it also. Uh, we, we came on board. Yeah. We came, came on board in yeah. June. In June. This year, yes. yes. Uh, that is the new commission. This mm. is the third commission of the Equal Opportunities Commission. Indeed. We have had two previous uh, commissions in the past. Mm. Mm. So uh, since June, of course, we have been reorganizing the commission. Uh, we have been compiling report, which was launched yesterday, mm. as you may know. Yes. Um, we have been reorganizing our human resource. Mm. We have traveled across the country, you know, to carry out the message of equal opportunities mm. to our people, especially those vulnerable communities out there in the countryside. Indeed. So in those 90 days, let's talk about some of those achievements you've been able to actually achieve and you can verifiably boast about right here on Morning at NTV, Mr. Oji. Oh, sure, yes. I think we have achieved a lot. And as you know, we have a, a mandate under the Public Finance Management Act mm -hmm. Uh, where we assess uh, ministerial policy statements, mm -hmm. budget framework papers, I see. And, and other budget processes Indeed. of the MDS, ministries, uh, departments, departments and agencies. And agencies. Mm -hmm. So we, we have been carrying out assessments to ensure uh, that they comply with gender and equity mainstreaming in their processes. In if their it is and Paris development model, ensure women are involved. If it is M yoga, ensure women are also involved. Not Youth only women. Okay. All groups. All groups. Yes. Youth Livelihood Fund. But when we do know a majority of the gender that is represented in these MDAs, they have to be the young men. Women will always pull through from behind. So we should be talking about making sure that more women are involved. But talk, talk to me about uh, these efforts. Are they actually bearing any fruit, gender equity in these MDAs yeah, and their programs? Yeah, exactly. Our, if you go through their budgets and their plans, for mm. example, you, you will establish that all segments of our population mm. are incorporated. Indeed. They are included in their budget and plans. And so to that effect, I could uh, safely say women, men, girls, mm. disabled persons, older persons, they're all included mm. in the budget processes mm. so that they all benefit mm. uh, in government programs and other services that are, that are rendered mm. to the entire population. Mm. So that there is no discrimination of what, whatever sort. Mm. So that then, as a result, no one should be marginalized. No one should be marginalized on, on, the, on this International Day of Older Persons. The theme was interesting. They're talking about ICT for the older people. They also want them to be included in the ICT development of uh, technologies that are taking root in the whole world. But talk to us about the whole state of vulnerable people within this country. What is the situation analysis that you have for us? That paint for us a picture of the state of vulnerability of Ugandans during this COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, definitely the rate of vulnerability is very high. Hmm. And this is a new phenomenon that has drawn in all sections of our society. Is it, new, is it a new phenomenon? It, Mr. it, it is. Or, or I mean, is it the COVID-19. Oh, yeah. Especially. All right. You know, it has rendered many people vulnerable, mm -hmm. as you know. I mean, people have lost employment. Mm. The youth have lost employment. They cannot find employment. Mm. Um, so many people have been affected by this COVID-19. Mm. Others, of course, have died. Others are still suffering the effects of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So vulnerability now is widely spread mm. until and unless it is arrested. Mm. Uh, I'm happy that there are efforts by government to vaccinate everybody, you know, to, to, to minimize the dangers, mm. you know, to, to lessen the burdens and those Health negative mm. effects. Mm of COVID-19. Mm. So you and me could also become vulnerable mm. tomorrow or today. And that is why there is this campaign that be careful, keep distance as we are doing now, do not contract COVID-19 so that you know you live a healthy life. So health-wise, government is helping our citizens pull through or alleviate the challenges of the pandemic by vaccinating them so that they do not grapple so hard. But then on the economic side of this uh, conversation, what is government doing to help individuals that pull through uh, this COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, well, of course, there were, there were the initial programs during the, mm. uh, the start of the pandemic mm. where uh, handouts were given to the very most vulnerable. Are we still calling them handouts, Mr. <laughs> then, this is taxpayers' money. <laughs> well, but there were handouts mm. in the sense that they were not supposed to be mm. something to be repeated over and over. I mean, it, it was meant to take them up to some mm. distance mm. 
as of now, government is introducing programs like, for example, the parish development model Indeed. with seven pillars. Indeed. And these are intended uh, to, to enhance the status of everybody. Mm right from the grassroots. Mm. So parishes, you know, parishes, you know, you also live in a parish, I Indeed. live in a parish. So if this development, this socioeconomic development starts from the parishes, then you can see that equality is being achieved. You mm. can see that access to socioeconomic services are being made available to all without any discrimination whatsoever. The youth are involved, the older persons are involved, the women are involved, the girl child is there, the boys are there, so everybody's ready. But then corruption has dogged many of these socio protection programs. We've seen many of the leaders who were supposed to give out money to the vulnerable people actually going ahead and uh, registering their relatives, family and friends, some of whom even went ahead to steal money. You are talking about AMUGA, Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Program, money disappeared, Youth Livelihood Fund, money disappeared. Leaders who are supposed to be advancing these funds to the vulnerable people are actually swindling this money in huge amounts. Would we say that this money has even sufficiently addressed the goal of the government, which is to alleviate the vulnerability, if it stayed in the hands of the leaders? <laughs> well, of course, those are allegations. Uh, and definitely Not allegations. Due Parliamentary underwent an exercise to actually ascertain whether or not this is true. And Mr. Mapenduzi and his team actually unequivocally and clearly stated that indeed leaders were actually swindling this money. And then due process should follow. Indeed. They should be prosecuted mm -hmm. and brought to book. Indeed. In this way, I think this will be a warning mm -hmm. to the would-be offenders. I see. So once prosecuted and convicted, then I think it will be better in the future. Well, people who stole COVID-19 money were never prosecuted. You remember last year, all that money that we had mobilized to ensure that we go ahead with these COVID-19 interventions, money went missing. But up to now, we do not know the whereabouts of that money or any perpetrator who was brought to book. Do you think there is political will to actually prosecute these cases if some of the leaders who are supposed to be prosecuting are involved in the same corruption, Mr. Ojuko? Uh, are there investigations going on? Well, I've been watching it on TV. Um, I do not know the extent to which the mm. investigations have been carried mm. out in preparation of prosecution, if mm. at all. Indeed. But of course, as I said, everybody is subject to the law. Mm. Uh, if investigations reveal that you're culpable, mm. then the law must take its course. Indeed. Uh, besides corruption, Mr. Ojuka, what are some of the negative factors that have actually made it impossible for the Equal Opportunities Commission, Commission to realize equal opportunities for all Ugandans in this country? What are some of those stumbling blocks you've encountered? Uh, well, corruption from, from which perspective? Uh, corruption when you give out money and uh, to the MDAs and those leaders who are supposed to send it to the vulnerable people eat the money. Yes. That's what we are talking about. Uh -huh. mm. so, so we are talking about what kind of other stumbling blocks are there that have actually made it impossible for the Equal Opportunities Commission to ensure that equal opportunities are realized for every Ugandan. Oh, well, of course, uh, ours is really to make recommendations mm. and, and to carry out our mandate in I accordance see. with the law, mm. to sensitize mm. the population, I see. to train duty bearers on how, for example, to mainstream um, gender inequity in their budget and plans, all right? Mm. So this is the far we can go. I see. Of course, and uh, at the same time, uh, the resource envelope is not as much. I see. I mean, we have a huge mandate mm. covering the whole country. Mm. We are supposed to touch the private sector, mm. the cultural institutions, mm. the civil society organizations, the MDAs and all this. So this is a very wide one. Everybody falls our, under our ambit. I see. And so we need both sufficient human resources, mm. we need sufficient financial resources, of course, which we are sharing with many other entities. Sufficient human and capital resource. We are we are in the know that you are soon merging or have already merged or there are proposals to merge you with Uganda Human Rights that Commission. That is the right one, yes. Do you think that is going to go a long way in helping you alleviate this challenge that you are saying about financial, more financial funding and also human resource? It would be speculative for me to say it is mm. going to alleviate it and uh, even mm. speculative for me to say that that we are going to merge with Uganda Human mm. Rights Commission. Mm. These are proposals that are being made at the mm. cabinet level and are yet to be discussed. Will they, will they bear it, it is business ongoing. Is it a magic bullet for this problem you just talked about? 
Which one is that? You said you are grappling with financial resources yes, and yes. also human resources in yes. that regard. So when you merge with the Human Rights Commission, would you have more people to actually work with and also more uh, resource budget? Of course, you know, the merger would mm. entail, you know, a lot of things. Indeed. Restructuring the human resource mm. and more bargain for increased financial resources from Ministry of Finance and I so see. forth. Now the issue is whether, is it enough? I mean, is it, for example, going to be allowed that we expand our structure? and get more people? Mm. Is it going to be allowed, for example, by the budget committee mm. that we get more financial resources mm. to execute our mandate? I see. So these are things that, yes, we can explore them. They might come through mm. in the short run or in the medium run mm. or in the, sh in, in the long run. Mm. But it is... It would be speculative of me hmm. to precisely state that yes, it is going to be exactly. But would you advocate for a merger between the Ghana Human Rights Commission and the AOC? And would you unequivocally state on this television that it will go a long way in helping you uh, champion your targets? Uh, so far, as EOC, we have been independent mm. and we are supposed to be Indeed. under the law and under the constitution mm. as well. We are a, a creation of the constitution. Mm. And to that extent, we have performed very well. Mm. Um, we have not had challenges as such mm. that would necessitate a merger as such. Mm. But uh, this decision is being taken by government mm. and definitely they have reasons why perhaps mergers should be the better option for us. Um, but otherwise, as EOC, I think mm. we have done pretty well. We have, uh, we have uh, produced reports which we have read. Indeed. We have gro gone across the country. We have assessed budgets. Uh, and I know and, someone who, might, have who might second your submission, and we that is none other than <laughs> Mr. Julius Kamia. You know of him, the commissioner. You <laughs> yes, told me, com Romeo, we do not need to march with the Uganda Human Rights Commission. We are already doing pretty, pretty well. But then let's talk about another issue. The report you released yesterday, yes. what were some of the recommendations entailed in that it will help vulnerable people raise again out of the pits of this pandemic yeah the, re the recommendations are there that mm. are contained in the in the in the report uh, share uh, with us some of those and, um, it is sector by sector mm. for example in the health sector yes we have made recommendations that uh, um, health centers should be established uh, in, in locations where they are, they are easily reachable by the vulnerable people mm. health centers as, as physical environments should have ramps for the disabled people. Indeed. They should have sections for older people, mm. for the older persons, so that they can easily access uh, health services. Mm. Pregnant mothers, for example. Mm. So these are some of the recommendations that we have made in the various sectors. Mm. In, the, uh, elect in, in the energy sector, mm. we have also made recommendations there about what the, minister of the, the sector should do for, for the vulnerable people, mm. for example, the ethnic minorities that have not been able to access mm. electricity for many reasons. In the education? Yes, mm. we have got to educate them. Mm. We have got to bring the grid as close to them as possible. Mm. We have to work on uh, issues of alleged corruption by some of the service providers and so forth. And also to empower them with knowledge. They should get to know the benefits of, uh, of energy, of electricity. Mm just as others are already beginning to enjoy cottage industries and so forth. Mm. So these are some of the challenges, some of the recommendations mm. that we have so far made and we'll be sharing with the various sectors. And we shall be here to disseminate all this information in a wholesome manner, courtesy of the EOC. Mr. Cox, Joel Ojuko, many thanks for having made the time to speak to us. Indeed. Thank and we shall you. always interact with you at the Equal Opportunities Commission. We Thank love the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank and you indeed, so you're much. still watching Morning at NTV. Is Alex Muhanji is already here. We shall, he shall be joined by uh, Andrew Kagwa, an arts and culture journalist. We want to talk about the nightlife economy. What is there to save from the concerts and also the artists under this heinous pandemic? We'll be right back with this conversation and a lot more. Keep it here.